Hello everyone, I'm Meet the Changeling. Wait, didn't a dude do the first episode? Uh, well, technically, no. Um, same person. I just forgot to disable my voice filter prior to recording this episode. Why do I use a voice filter? Well, <laughs> this is why. Yeah, um, I'd rather not be harassed about any of that. It doesn't make what I have to say here or the fact that I want to help you guys make better worlds any different at all. But I do want to say that if you guys have like actual problems understanding me with this filter on, I will happily turn it off for the rest of these videos. No problem. I was going to do that anyways this time. I just forgot to, and I'm sorry about that. And since, you know, I don't really have a script or like really do much about this than just speak from the heart and talk about it on time. I mean, I got my notes of talking points. I just don't script everything out. So I can't really just redo this episode's voiceover easily. So, and you know, let's just be professional about this and move on. And if it's a problem, let me know in the comments and I'll make sure it's not a problem ever again. Or if you actually find this voice pleasant to listen to, also let me know and I'll just not have to worry about turning off my voice filter for you guys. Welcome back to Detailed Oriented World Building. I'm just going to start this off with a quick apology for the episode zero, with you see introduction to this whole series. I had never used OBS Recode Studio before, and I didn't have anything set up for my microphone at all. I figured my sound card could handle everything, but apparently OBS records in a little bit of an interesting way, and in trying to eliminate some very loud inhaling breath sounds, which got we put into recording pretty frequently. I muddled things up fairly badly. So the audio quality last time wasn't very good. Serviceable, but not good. Hopefully everything will work out just fine now and be perfectly fine. Even better, I'm able to produce these a whole hell of a lot quicker. Since I found a way to simply start up my music, and just get that naturally ingrained into the background, play it as I talk to you guys, and be a little chill, go through everything, make it all work, and I don't have to spend, you know, two or three hours after the whole episode just soundtracking everything. It's all integrated and shuffled, and I can just credit everything when I post a video. Now, since a lot of you may not have watched the first episode, well, which is the episode zero, I know this one's called episode one, that's called episode zero. I'm just going to quickly summarize what was in that. It was an analysis of the philosophy I had behind world building, and basically me just sh saying that the computer you're sitting at to do your writing can be a whole hell of a lot more than just a fancy typewriter that cost you a couple hundred bucks. Or, and your, you know, your Facebook machine and your research terminal. It can do a lot of the grunt work for you when you're doing your world building. But we're not going to get to that today. Today I want to talk about the very first things you should be doing when you are working on a world. Just absolutely, positively, the very first thing. And that is setting up your canvas. Now I got a document right here, right? It's gonna open with LibreOffice Writer, but I don't need to, it's already open. Just so we can have it right on my desktop in the workspace. Now this is what I'm gonna call the setting canvas. And you notice that there's a little whip setting Bible remark. Yeah, that's what these are for officially called, but I'm gonna use a metaphor involving painting, hopefully make this a little bit more easier for a complete novice to understand. And I'll tell you complete novices out there, what we're doing is we are building a fictional universe completely from scratch, exactly how we want it, no holds barred, and we're just going to go through it in simple orderly fashion, and we're going to wind up using this detail-oriented method to get a nice, logical, sensible universe, and I'm going to build my own live in these episodes for you to see. Well, not necessarily always live, sometimes I'll have to do some cuts for the sake of your time, but you'll see this project evolve with every single thing I'm telling you how to do, you're going to see me do it. Now let's get started. So if you've ever worked with paint, you know that you, when you, what kind of canvas you paint on makes a huge difference to your end project. Now some canvases are rough, others are smooth, some paint on velvet, others on cotton, it's all up to the artist, but each of these choices have a huge impact on the final result. Just like how everything you're about to do here will have a huge impact on the final result of the world you build. Now, the elements we care about here are in order of the tile we're going to choose them, the material, the texture, the primer, and the paints. And yes, it's all painting metaphors, and uh, I'm personally autistic, I find metaphors a little hard, so if you guys find this metaphor hard to follow, let me know and I'll try to make it a little bit more clear. So the first 
film that we're going to deal with here is material. That's, you know, what, i.e. what your canvas is made of. For world building, we only really have two choices. We have a choice between fantasy and science fiction. I want to read you guys a quote on fantasy and science fiction I found from a professional class on how to tell stories. Ahem. What is the difference between fantasy and science fiction? At first glance, it can seem like a simple question. Science fiction often takes place in a dystopian society sometime in the future and contains elements of advanced technology. A fantasy story, on the other hand, is usually set in the fantasy realm and includes mythical creatures and supernatural powers. Though the similarities between these two genres are readily apparent, there are more similarities and crossovers between the two genres that meets the eye. Now, that's not untrue, but it's also confusing. It's also not entirely untrue. Now, science fiction has nothing to do with dystopias, as this implies, and it's the first thing that comes up when you search what the difference between these things is, so it's kind of ridiculous, right? So, science fiction doesn't have anything to do with dystopias. Dystopia is this type of setting. It's not inherent in science fiction. Science fiction also doesn't need to be in the future, or even in the present. Likewise, fantasy doesn't have to play with elements from mythology or even the supernatural. So what are these? Well, science fiction has the goal of examining an aspect of the human condition. Everything it does is to take a specific idea, event, or situation, and make a statement about the human existence using it. Science fiction is both the story of humanity building its first extraterrestrial colony, and also the story of the first iron ink it ever smelted. Science fiction can absolutely be set in the past. The key is that whenever it's set, whatever happens in it, science fiction is always about some technology or scientific possibility occurring and its impact on humanity. Fantasy, meanwhile, is everything else. Literally. Fantasy is anything that's possible. Uh, focusing on telling a tale that may or may not have meaning, but isn't some central bit of tech or some theoretical possibility. In short, science fiction is about how we create and experience what changes us. Fantasy is about how we choose to create and what we experience. And a more practical example, Star Wars is fantasy. Star Trek is usually science fiction. Now, for the sake of this project, I'm going with fantasy. I think that there is enough... Uh, excuse me, I have some poor smelling. I think that there's enough stories that are talking about all these allegories and metaphors and using their story to make some kind of statement on the nature of man. Anti-A. That's fine. There we go. So, we're gonna go with fantasy. We're gonna go with something that's a little bit more out there, a little more fantastical, and just doing it for the fun of it. That's what I want for my project. If you want to do something else, that's perfectly fine when you're following along with us. Again, I'm choosing what I want, you choose what you want. This method will work for anything. Next, texture. Texture is the intended age of your audience. This is something so fundamental to your work and so important that it really does need to be done second. Why second? Well, when creating a world, you don't want the process to limit you. You want to use the process to its fullest. If you do this first, you may decide that younger kids may not like or want sci-fi. This isn't true. There's sci-fi for kids. We generally call it edutainment, and it often falls into the fantasy realm, usually, but it can be science fiction as well. And it exists and is an important selection of media. Now, we all know that little kids, teens, young adults, adults, and the older folks out there have different preferences. Not just because of the culture they grew up in, but because of the general stages of life and human development. Kids are scared of monsters, while adults are scared of concepts, for example. Why is this important? Because stories are all based on conflict. At least the ones people remember the most are. Stories without conflict are, you know, if they're not an allegory for something in real life, and they're just the most banal thing. A good story has conflict, a reason why stuff is happening and why we should care about our heroes or heroes' struggles. So, this follows then that good world building makes spaces for specific types of conflict to happen. Each age category of people has their own specific type of conflict that resonates with them the most. Now, a brief aside, there's a little bit of magic you can do here at the world building level. 
Uh, most of this has to be done in writing, but remember, world building is the canvas in the first two layers of paint. Writing is the last layer of paint on that canvas. The world building has to exist or the writing is flimsy at best. You can technically write your world in a way that provides niches for two or even all three age groups to have a story that they would like. This is advanced, naturally, but we're doing the basics right now. I just want to let you know that it can be done. If you wanted to create something that children could come back and ex it could experience and enjoy, then adults could come back to it later and find a whole new meaning in it. That's how you do it. You make sure your world building can support stories of a type that have something for more than one group. And you can do that if you like. Go ahead and give it a try. But for this project, I'm just going to stick to one age group. We're doing the basics here. So bear in mind, what I'm about to say is all very general and meant to just give you an idea. I'm pretty sure there's an entire semester of work in developmental psychology on what I'm about to say, so I might get it messed, mixed up. I didn't do too much psychology. My major was humanities. My minor was creative writing. <laughs> Anyways. So, again, generally speaking, young kids are all about coolness and style over substance. That's not to say they want mindless things, so far from it. Kids like stuff that doesn't treat them like idiots more than stuff that does. What this does mean is that young kids are more likely to like a hero because of his awesome jetpack rather than any sort of relatable traits in their background or mannerisms or characterizations. You also can't make things too complex, not because kids are stupid, but because young kids' brains still process morality in black and white. Bad guys are bad. Good guys are good. Moral gray just isn't present for them yet. It's a thing you develop later in life, and it's biological. It's not social. It's just don't do that when they're young. And again, another thing that's also biological is they're still genuinely frightened by monsters simply by the monsters existing. And they're also frightened by being in strange, weird places or around things that are just generally really odd and creepy. It's due to their lack of experience in the world. They've only lived so long, right? So, in short, children are focused most on conflict that includes personal danger to survival. They're also captivated by things as they appear at a glance, that the real cool very much controls what they like. Now, when it comes to teens, teens generally want freedom, and they have a desire to express themselves and find themselves. And they usually prefer stories about overcoming long odds and power fantasy. Now, it's very important to remember that males and females generally have very different power fantasies, uh, that's a whole thing on its own. It's something for you to look up on your own about what it constitutes male power fantasy and what constitutes female power fantasy. And they're not incompatible, but if you want to write something that's for both boys and girls who are teens, you're going to have to make some compromises in your actual narrative. It doesn't matter to the world building, so we're not going to cover it here. Now, it's no coincidence that most dystopian novels are written for teens and usually end with the chosen one, taking down the dystopia somehow. See, teens want to feel special and unique. This is the time in a human life where you're out to find your place in the world. And consequently, that's exactly what teens enjoy in stories. A place in the world where they thrive. Like, they like to see themselves in the main character, and that means in general they're looking for a time that lets them be awesome. Now, teens are also less afraid of monsters now. Like, at least the ones that are just, you know, Blarg, Ham, Werewolf. Uh, you need to start attaching concepts to those monsters that add elements of subtle horror. Uh, concepts that make things extra nasty for the individuals they attack. But teens don't even really understand how much damage small things can do to society simply because they still haven't lived long enough, you know? Now, that's not to call teens dumb. It's, again, it's just all about different life experiences. And I myself, being the fact that I'm not that old of an adult, uh, I'm certain that there's things that older people than me understand that I don't, and... And if I'd ever figure those out, I'll probably come back here and update this. But again, uh, so teens, they're not scared of the werewolves, it's just blogger werewolf. They're more afraid of the werewolf that bites you, and if you survive the bite, you're infested with parasitic worms that they don't kill you, but like, eat parts of your flesh, and now you look horrible, and it's all this amazing personal consequence to you specifically. That's the kind of thing that scares teens the most. If if a horror movie is aimed at teens, that is what they're actually doing. That's the kind of stuff, right? And so that uh, teens also want some romance and sexual content in their stories. 
after all, this is the time when the instinct reproduces the strongest in humans. It's, you know, the teenagers in the early 20s. And the, it's important to note here that I'm not saying that just because I'm promoting promiscuity or anything. See, the, the instinct is so strong in people at that age that teens may not be able to connect to a character who doesn't feel the same strong needs they do feel right now in their lives. If your characters don't feel the need to love and be loved, they just might not ever really relate. And as much as relatability isn't important, it's also very important. It's a whole nuanced part of writing. So, in short, teens are focused more on conflict that has social aspects which are personal and immediate. They're also captivated the most by power fantasy elements, especially those which provide feelings of a place in the world and being inherently important to something. They also want some lewdness in their tales. Now, adults, are, they're, they're generally speaking, uh, well, let's be honest, bored. The world's mundanity has set in, and adults understand that life is a grind. Their brains have developed, and they understand moral grays. The idea of an adventure or quest as a thing to do in and of itself because it is cool has likely faded away. Adults need reasons why. Why what? Why everything? Why should he go on this adventure? Why is this a threat to his nation? Why, why, why? This makes adults harder to write for, but also much more rewarding. Adults understand that someone who wants to, dis uh, to change the zoning laws of their community could easily disadvantage an entire ethnic group for centuries to come. Adults think. Adults notice the small things. Adults will look at the uh, the practice of a this uh, the, the, sorry the mind pa the parasite dispensing werewolf and say, hey, that's bad. We need to stop that. But look. It's killed off these three people who are the heads of these local political parties, which means that these second in commands of those parties have now taken power, and it's all because of this werewolf. I think this is some kind of plot to change the laws and open hunting in the state park, which in turn would... See, that's the kind of thing that makes adults actually a blast to write for. They find these little details, and even if they're completely wrong, the adult is always looking at all the little things that cause conflict, not just for them or the main characters, but the groups of people in these stories. They're looking at the bigger picture than younger ages do. But they also look at the smaller picture, of course, but adults, they're interested in that big picture. That kind of thing makes adults a blast to write for. Now, adults also want romance and sexual content, generally speaking. They usually want less than teens because, you know, the hormones have cooled down by now, and yeah, adults understand that there's more to life than just socializing, screwing, and going to school. But, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's an like important little caveat here. In your world-building sense, you might want to leave some adult elements in when writing for adults. And by adult elements, I mean erotic elements. Like, make sure that this can be a thing in your stories if you really want it to be, because, well, to be completely frank, there are some adults who only read stories that have actual porn in them. Now, they're not there just for the porn, as weird as that might sound, but many adults see stories where two leads who love each other never hooking up is completely unrealistic because, well, as an adult, if you think a person is hot and they think you're also hot and you guys hit it off, you just go to some place and bang. That's just how things are. And because of that, and it might be a nice experience for an adult reader to encounter society in your world that doesn't have the same taboos against certain things that, you know, human societies on Earth do in real life. It can be a form of escapism, and escapism is very important just for everyone of all ages. So in short, adults are focused most on conflict which impacts groups and how those groups uh, respond to one, uh, one another because of that conflict. They're captivated most by the smaller facets of stories that combine with one another to form overall impressions, i.e. the subtle details, which make work unique or make the experience of something otherwise familiar into something unique once more. Novelty is what adult audiences crave the most. As relatively people, well, I haven't been one yet. I have no personal experience with them, but from what I can tell, what I've read, what I've studied, and the people I ask, uh, old people like everything adults do, but they also appreciate falling back into younger mindsets. That they often read to their grandchildren, or just as likely to pick up a book that's a YA novel as, you know, an Isaac Arthur book or something, or 
some other great big dusty tome meant for the adult to crunch out over a year. Old people just don't give a damn. They're set in their ways and are too tired to care what you think of them for the most part. There are old people who just sit around and drink beer and wait to die, and then there's also this one 80-year-old woman on YouTube who plays Skyrim and loves putting axes into the heads of high elf craniums. Heads of high elf craniums. I'm sorry, I'm a little bit uh, sick still, so... Regardless, I think you can do anything at all, and older people will just enjoy it. So, if you want to write for old people, just do whatever. You'll probably find an audience with younger individuals than them as well. Anyways, uh, for the purpose of this project, I'm going to write for adults. Why am I going to write for adults? Well, it's because I am one. And I really think that there's a lack of fun for fun's sake stories, and universes that support that within the adult world. There's too many cautionary tales out there, and too many allegories for my tastes. Just, uh, I believe the responsible thing to do is to create something that lets people know that it's okay as an adult to just relax once in a while, and have fun, and stop taking things so seriously all the time. Of course, it's important to take things seriously, but it's equally important to take time away from that. There's a whole craze about mental health recently, right? Well, one big part of mental health is knowing that sometimes you just gotta step back and not deal with that stuff. Take a little time to breathe. That's what I want to provide for people. Next up, we got the primer. You know, <clears throat> that's the themes and elements that we will use to block out our creation. Now, what do I mean by themes and elements? It's a surprisingly easy question that surprisingly few people who make content know the answer to. Have you ever read a book and at the end of it had no clue what the story meant? You had a full understanding of the plot and the characters and the characters' relationships and what the characters did, but in the end, what the hell was all this brouhaha about? That is what happens when a story doesn't have clear themes. How do you get clear themes? Well, a lot of that is in the writing process and conveyed by the narrative, but you need to make sure your themes are supported in your world building if you want your narrative and your setting and plot to all walk hand in hand down the path to something actually great. Just, let's, let's be honest. You don't want to just tell a story that's going to sell a few copies and make you a few bucks. Uh, even if you are in this just for the money, you want to tell a great story that impacts people in such a way that they treasure your tale forever. That is how you as a writer become immortal. That's how your name gets mentioned in the same breath as Brian Sanderson, R.A. Salvador, or Tolkien, or Isaac Asimov. It's also how you get a movie deal. So whether or not you're just in here to tell a good story that reaches many people, or get paid, you want to tell a great story. So you want your world building to support your themes. But oh, wait, you cry. Doesn't the genre dictate themes? Why are we picking the theme before the genre? Yeah, well, the genre d does a bit. Nor a lot. Depends on the genre and your cultural expectations for it. But look, if you want to have a huge impact on storytelling, you want to pick your themes and elements first. If you pick the genre first, your cultural bias will dictate more of the story's path than you might want it to. Choosing the genre before theme is to choose cliché before novelty. Now, that's not to say there's nothing valuable to learn from prior works. Far from it. Very far from it. Those stories got popular and did well for good reasons. However, if you don't let yourself use a genre as it is intended, as guidelines rather than rules, you have no chance of making something unique. Think about today's marketplace of ideas and entertainment. It's real saturated, isn't it? You want to make sure your work is not too different, or people will want to pick it up because it lacks any obvious ties to what they know and that they like. But it cannot be derivative, or people just won't care about it. How many stories are there that are basically just Lord of the Rings, but on a different map? Probably tens of thousands at this point. You don't want to make another one of those. No one's going to care about it besides you and maybe one or two other people. And if you're out here and hear this for the money, it's not going to sell. You don't want to do that. So, okay, how do we pick a theme and what are themes? Well, there's countless themes. I could do a whole episode just on themes. So I'm not going to. What I am going to do is rattle off a few themes for you. Man versus nature. 
good versus evil, what it means to be human, love, family, revenge, the folly of youth, capitalism is bad, capitalism is good, myth versus fact, friendship. Those are all themes. You might notice that some of those concepts are super duper broad. Yep. You can pick more than one, too. In fact, you should pick several themes. But what you're doing here is ensuring your world building can support all the kinds of stories that you want to tell with this world. Uh, for example, if you want to tell a story about the nature of good and evil, it would almost certainly benefit your story to have the universe itself provide clear good and clear evil. If your heroes are constantly fighting through situations which are morally gray, for morally gray reasons, which they say are good, but the reader can genuinely question and come up with another answer, your theme has failed. In short, fantasy races that are just evil are important to telling stories about the nature of good and evil. In those settings, good and evil are not just concepts held close to the hearts of men, but physical laws with real properties and effects on reality that exist outside the actions of mortal man. See? Theme is very important to world building, critically. Now to make sure that your themes support the stories you want to tell with this world. And they get totally ingrained and entangled up right from the beginning. So, next we have our elements. What do I mean by elements? Well, two things. Uh, first and shortest, elements are bits of culture and myth that you'll draw from to color your world. No fiction is created in a vacuum and there's no shame to taking bits and bobs from other sources to make your own creations with. Do you like the trappings of Greek mythology? Use some of that element in your world building. Do you think ancient Egyptian architecture is neat? Well, use some of that too. But just keep track of those elements that you're using and write down why those elements were used in the source material in your notes. You won't use it right if you don't understand it. For instance, yes, in Greek mythology, you have gods intervening in mortal affairs constantly. If you like that, you want to use it while also preserving how it feels in Greek myth when it happens, it helps to know that Greek poets use the gods as explanations for the unknown. As a result, the Greek gods appear to do something for the plot that is otherwise explainable. Greek gods interfere to smooth over plot holes and also bring wonder, awe, and a sense that there is an intended order to the universe. Understand that, and you can make gods that do the same thing and have the same vibe while being different in character and make those that character as different as you wish. You could make it so that people don't even think that you ripped off the Greek gods but still get that general feel of awe and wonder that you felt when reading Greek mythology. Now, for the longer part of what elements are, and at the risk of trapping you in a six-hour spiral of madness, have you ever heard of TV tropes? The website? Yeah, uh, you're gonna want to sit down with TV tropes or some other guide and look at all the big, far-reaching tropes. And these are usually called setting tropes. I've linked the TV tropes index of them in the description. Uh, please finish this video before you do that. It, I'm serious, that website is a major time sink. So, get yourself a big old list of setting tropes and figure out which ones you want to be fundamental to your world's workings. Now wait, you cry, but I thought you said I shouldn't wholesale rip off the past. I totally did, and you should not. But you should also use what worked before if people still like it. A cliché is a trope that is old, tired, and worn out. A trope is simply a common element within stories that help bring them all and bind them to a single time, place, and culture. Tropes are good. Just be sure to use them in a unique way. I'm, I'm sure you've thought, seen plenty of examples of when tropes go wrong and have left the incompetence on display. You don't want to make that mistake. Now, you may want to include other elements that are not tropes per se, but just part of a genre here, but in general, focus more on the tropes than slices a genre. We'll get to there. It's more fun to do it this way. Now, here's an example of narrative tropes that apply at the world-building level and what they mean. AI is a crapshoot. AI can exist, but it always turns out to be evil. Honestly, that one's kind of becoming a little cliche. It's almost always a surprise when the AI is nice these days, so maybe avoid it, but it's still an example of a big, universe-spanning trope that governs how everything in that world works. It's also applied to philtrobium, or philobium. Not quite sure how you pronounce that one. It's a bit of a weird spelling. 
that is, you know, there's a thing. It's a substance, an energy, or some stuff that is the source of most, if not all, the other fantastical things in the setting. You know, magic, power crystals, nanomachines, or a significant number of orcs in agreement on the subject at hand. Now, warp travel. It's possible to move fast and light by bending space-time. After the end, a catastrophe, man-made or natural, has wiped out a large portion of civilization or the population. Place beyond time. There is at least one place in the setting, if not the entire setting, that is outside of time somehow. Think Land of the Lost, Journey to the Center of the Earth, or that one kid book that ripped off the X-Men but has the school in a time loop during World War II. Time of Myths. Ancient myths are not only real, but are all mashed together into one time period. Amazing technicolor work. A colorful book. Literally. Everything is bright and cheerful looking, possibly even the people. It's usually seen in kid cartoons, but it's also in comic books and comic book inspired movies. See the old Flash Gordon film. Ancient tombs. The whole land is just riddled with tombs and burial changer troopers and sculptures and mausoleums and crypts and sometimes even whole dungeons catacombs and all those things. That's, that's a trope, but it's also very important to the foundation of many adventure novels from the past. There's also the, uh, some, like, you know, that just city norm. You know, it's, it's like a city, except it's always dark and rainy and crime is everywhere, but the police are useless. The multiverse, there are many connected parallel universes, sometimes called parallel universes. Only one afterlife. Regardless of personal morality, you're sent to the same place by death after default. Whatever the actions one may have committed in life, and everyone who dies is sent to the same thing. See? Elements are complicated, and there are tons of them. Tens of thousands, probably. And most of them need world-building support to function. If you wrote a cyberpunk novel, and you used the city noir trope, but never explained why the police are useless, sure, some people would just accept that because the genre. Why not show them why the cops are useless, and in so doing, tell a more interesting and developed story? Why not create a world where cops can't do their jobs due to political shenaniganery resulting from a recent merger of two megacorps, and the new combined corps struggle with the city government for power? Boom! Way more interesting than Blue Man Dad. So what am I doing for this project? Yeah, well, this is the long and hard one to work out, for me at least. I think I will set my world up with the following themes. Myth versus fact. That's uh, stuff along the lines of, like, there's a, you know, like the mummy. It turns out that mummies are actually real. That's myth versus fact. It's what we believe we know coming into a counter with mythology. It turns out that myth is true, and it can be the other way around, too. It's a way to play around with these elements of mythology in a more modern and developed setting. I'm also going to go ahead and use good versus evil. Oops. Now, good versus evil is a classic, and it's a classic for a reason. It's a, it's a way to have good moral lessons in a story, and it's also a way to have a little bit of fun by integrating some older elements of human mythology. Like, you can have devils and angels in battles as part of the big backstory, and it just a, it's a good one to include if you want to do what I'm about to do, and that is adventure. I want to have a themes of adventure in this universe. I don't want this to be a big old place just to talk about social issues or political reforms. No, 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 no. This is about adventure. This is about discovery. This is about the journey into the unknown, coming back, having met that unknown, knowing it. That's the kind of stuff I enjoy. If you enjoy this stuff, have at it. Now, that's yeah, that's, that, that's not, not quite enough for me to think that I'm, I've got an, a good chunk of what I want here. Uh, what else should I do? Well, how about the, uh, a pretty topical one for the current era? Yeah, individuality versus community. That's a theme. Where does the individual rights stop and the community's rights begin? A good question to have, and if you make that a theme in the universe, you can tell some pretty interesting and purely culturally relevant stories. But, uh, you know, those are just themes, right? Oops. <laughs> Not quite sure why that happened. 
So, just make that note, and we'll get this all nice and organized. Now, the more organized you keep your canvas document, the better. Let's go ahead and just bump that on in. Hold the metallicized bits. Edit. Bump that in one. Pop it back out. Oops. Elements. What elements do I want to use here? What elements of storytelling and world building support the themes I have picked? That's what we're on about right here, right? Well, how about after the end? You know, this way we can have uh, some ancient precursor civilization with that had left behind the ruins and artifacts that we can have uh, bad guys or heroes out to find or exploit or destroy, you know? That sounds good to me, and a good thing that goes with that pretty well is ancient tombs, the one I mentioned up above. It's just a pretty good way to have for a place for all the artifacts left behind after the end of that one civilization to have been locked away. Maybe even old people, sir. Culturally relevant artifacts or great machines in some ancient, dusty, forgotten vault. He has a classic adventure stuff. Let's see. What else? Uh, well, if we're having themes of good and evil, why not? Uh, the good old evil tainted place. That's a pretty good one, you know? Oh, wow. I think I might have to trim the dictionary down a little bit here. That's quite a lot of suggestions. So, evil painted the place. That's the idea in fiction that there can be places that are evil. The place itself is evil and bad because something horrible happened there once and that paint just seeped in and has never left. Always a good staple for a universe where you're telling adventure stories and themes of good versus evil. Now, let's see. Uh, we do definitely need more of these. Oh, well, uh, while I'm on the good versus evil theme, I think I should mention that I will be avoiding the good kingdom and the evil empire, and instead go with uh, something of a less common one, but that is evil are good or evil. And uh, that's that's a rather important one there, because um, the point I'm going for with the good versus evil theme is that it's the collective behavior of individuals rather than the will of the state that matters for whether or not a group good for evil. Now, uh, let's also toss some Eldritch stuff in here. You know, we got that myth versus fact theme. You might as well go with that kind of stuff. We'll go with Eldritch location. And, um, yeah, that, that lets us have locations that are just kind of, you know, genuinely uh, fantastical and weird, don't apply it by the laws of physics. They might be genuinely horrifying or they might be wondrous and I'm recycling one of my older ideas here, and, uh... I want to have black holes be thinking beings that are akin to gods. So there's, there's just so much you can do with that idea. And because I'm also including that, we have those locations are also technically... Eldritch Entity. Let's make sure everything is spelled right. Now, uh, there's a good chunk of stuff here, but... Our themes aren't saturated. There's more we can add. There's more that those things support, and we don't even have anything for individuality or security at all, so, uh... Well, how about starfish aliens? That's, you know, the genuinely alien-looking or acting aliens. So instead of just aliens being humans, but with forehead ridges, all the Star Trek, this is how you get, like, yeah, they're people, but they legitimately look like kind of like starfish, and they eat metals, you know? That's the kind of interesting stuff that I like in science fiction, and it works well in other genres, too. Well, science fiction isn't really a genre, it's a category. But you know what I mean. A lot of people in the common vernacular, they call it a genre. Let's see, uh... Well, if we're gonna do interesting and cool aliens, why not have, uh, exotic FTL? That's when you have FTL that's not just warp drive, or wormholes, or jump drives, or hyperspace. It's when there's some interesting and exotic and kind of novel method that's a little bit more fantastical for moving faster than light. You'll see what I mean in a future episode. Let's see, uh... This should be 
think that'd be a pretty decent basis for a science fantasy universe as I'm working on it, so, um, let's uh, add the possibility to tell some stories for the, uh, to cover the individual versus community theme by tossing in the world of extras, uh, a bunch of them. Now, this is also known by another name, which I'm going to type out now, which might bias you a little bit. Planet of Hats. Now, Planet of Hats is not actually a bad thing. It's when it's handled poorly that it's a bad thing. So, we're going to balance this out by having not all of our planets be Planets of Hats. A good big chunk of our universe will be normal and diverse, but we're going to have some worlds that have a singular culture. That way we can have, you know, stuff like the Planet of Amazons. And... The reason this is good and interesting for individuality versus community, well, that you, how better to tell a story about the rights of the individual than the rights of a community than to have a Planet of Hats situation that is well-designed and built on good, solid reasons for why almost everyone in this culture acts this way, and then show the story of somebody in that culture trying to forge their own path. That is a good way to do a theme of individuality versus community. Let's see. Is that everything? Well, for now. You can always add more, and uh, we'll probably add a few more when we come through in the next stage and block the, uh, out the basic colors on this canvas. But, for now, the paints. Paints, now. Those are, uh, you know... This is the genre. Exactly which genre is this setting going to be? It's an important question, not just because it colors the rest of the canvas and it's a setup for what we will be telling by acting as the guidelines for all future creations, uh, which we will go outside of any time we find a good reason to, by the way. But many people use genre as the primary indicator of whether or not they would be interested in your work. Now, we've blocked out the idea of telling the stories of adventure, which see myth interacting with fact, good struggling against evil, and the balance of individuality with community. All of that is dressed up in the desire to have ancient ruins of a past foliage and fallen empire in space where we get around the vast interstellar sea by some kind of exotic means not commonly seen in fiction. And within this sea there are genuinely alien beings and eldritch entities either lurking within black holes or maybe they just are black holes. We've also got some uh, planet of hats to play with by making them realistic for the setting's history. Then we want there to be, uh, adventures coming along through all these elements, right? Well, it might sound like we should just stamp a science fantasy on, uh, logo on this and call it a day. It's just not a space opera, right? Well, it doesn't need to be. Not at all, even. This could easily be high fantasy. Switch the chocolate to vanilla, and thus tech becomes magic. And you can have something like Treasure Planet sailing ships in space where mages keep crystal engines in perfect harmony to sail between the stars, with each planet or star system a kingdom dedicated to its own god or pantheon, effectively giant floating city-states on islands in the cosmic sea. And the same concept for science fantasy now works just fine with swords and spells instead of blasters and gadgets. Or... You could have the main character be from Modern Earth, and BAM! Time travel story, with the objective being to get home. We also put the focus on stopping the plans of these elders of the Deep, which is accomplished by the use of agents who are given temporary magical or technological powers to put them on par with super-powered agents of evil, and oh, look at that! Now this is a magical girl anime. Or, you perhaps the crew of a starship in this crazy world of ancient evils and cosmic goods, is out trying to find justice for something comparatively small and personal. But it all gets tangled up in some big plot or another because the world is just full of grit and shadows. Boom! Now it's a detective noir setting. You may have noticed that you can do those last few with uh, either of the first two at the same time. Yeah! A good setting can support many subgenres. Uh, make sure you only have one main genre, though. One thing that colors all of the rest of the bits... Uh, it's often a bit tricky to get an audience to buy a world where wooden ships fly through space to do battle with Imperial Star Destroyers. Uh, unless, of course, you're doing crossover fanfiction. Or you're including My Little Pony characters. Uh, you can do almost anything in fanfics and still have readers. It's wonderful. 
But shout out doing fanfic, so you gotta be a little more careful to make sure that your world feels cohesive and, like, all the parts of it fit with each other. So it's not as cut and dry as it seems, and just look into the many, many genres and subgenres of fiction. Find the ones you like. Hey, you may be totally unaware that your favorite fantasy stories all have certain common elements that make them, you know, one particular genre. Perhaps the reason you like all those is because they're in the witch works genre, and you just discovered it, and now you can make something in that genre. Now, for this project, I'm going to be going with my heart. This world will be built as science fantasy. Now, science fantasy is one of the broader genres. So, what kind of science fantasy do I want? Do I just want a, a science fiction story that's mostly about the universe itself rather than the technologies in it? Nah. Nah. I want some magic in there to spice up physics and hammer out some of the things that can be done in that universe. I want a band of unlikely heroes with adorable robot friends traveling in chrome-clad starships to face off against an evil space wizard tyrant. I want that kind of a universe. Oh, and uh, let's just toss in the subgenre of fantastic science. So we'll go back here. You know, some science fantasy. Good, good, good. And, uh, you know, the subgenres. Fantastic science. Now, what is fantastic science? Some of you may not know, and that's when meta science is pretty much magic. It doesn't mean that, like, science can do everything. It just means that there is magic in this setting, but it has pretty strict rules. Now, magic A is magic A. None of that nonsense that you see in, for example, like, Harry Potter. You see, magic without rules ruins the setting, in my opinion. If it doesn't for you, that's fine. Go with what your heart says. But for me, it just sucks all the tension and danger and drama right out of a situation. If you have to ask, wait, since Harry is technically part of Voldemort, he technically owns everything Voldemort owns. So why can't Harry Potter just use that object summoning spell to bring him all the Horcruxes and then the Sword of Gryffindor? I'm sorry if I just ruined Harry Potter for you. I doubt it. That fan base is fanatically loyal. But the fact remains that, uh, its magic doesn't really have many clear rules, and Mothra also kind of breaks those rules a lot. Probably because you didn't write them down in the first place and get everything plotted out from the beginning like we're doing right now. Alright, let's review what we've done here. What canvas have I set up for myself to work with? I have set myself up to write a fantasy story, to, you know, based on the tastes and preferences of adults. It's going to be dealing with themes of myth versus fact and good versus evil, adventure and individuality versus community. It's the elements that will support those themes are after the end. So there's been an apocalypse. It's left ancient materials and tombs all around the place. Good and evil are supported by the fact that evil can literally just taint something. And it, but instead of these big cosmic forces being the true source of good or evil, it's the people who are the source of good and evil. At the same time, there are eldritch locations and eldritch entities. The monks that they're just out there lurking amongst the stars, as are genuinely alien beings, and this cosmic ocean can be traveled through an exotic means. There's also sitting out there the planet of hats, but balance with diverse worlds. And of course, that is all going to be seen and made through the lens of science fantasy. It's the genre subgenre of fantastic science. And next time, I might find another subgenre that I might want to tack on here, or maybe in working on this, I will find out that there's some other things I can include. But for now, this is my canvas. This document right here, next time, I will expand into something that accurately explains the broadest strokes of the universe that has been put down here on paper. I'm Meet the Changeling. I hope you found this useful. Have a nice night.